All right. Uh, so, Tex, uh, I really appreciate you coming out here. Uh, I guess coming out, you're probably sitting at your desk drinking coffee like I am. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's that is that is me to a T. Drinking coffee, working on guns. Oh, 100 percent. Oh God, we got to talk guns at some point. I sure. I'm a huge gun nut. Uh, but so the reason I asked you to talk was because uh, as I originally approached you, I did a charity for um, Stack Up, which is an organization that uses gaming uh, in order to help veterans uh, and even active duty uh, enlisted personnel deal with things like PTSD and the struggles that come with uh, military service. Uh, you know, stuff like sending out a TV and a PlayStation so uh, to someone in country. So it's like, hey, you came back from patrol. Why don't you chill out and play some Alan Wake? Uh, or that's helping. A, that's a great organization. That oh, sounds wonderful. Stack Up is great. And they do stuff like um, for veterans that come back, you know, a very common criticism, well, not criticism, uh, difficulty that veterans have is reintegrating into social uh, stuff because military has such a very unique social dynamic. Um, and so they do stuff like organize uh, tabletop RPG campaigns so you can learn how to socialize with normal people through D&D or uh, Dark Heresy or any of these things. Uh, they also provide um, connection to veterans to like crisis services in case these more fun ways of handling stuff isn't what you need. You need to talk to someone now. Uh, and they do that as well. And because of all that, that got me thinking about really wanting to pick the brain of someone that knows a lot about military history uh, and has studied history about how militaries and like similar uh, organizations uh, throughout history have used the idea of entertainment to help raise troop morale and like uh, deal with the very real difficulties of, of uh, a, a life at arms, which is even though the nature of warfare has changed in many ways, the, the struggle of the soldier in this way often really has not, right? Like, you're far away from your loved ones, you're you're always at risk, and, like, it is always a, gru a grueling life. Uh, so entertainment has, has, I imagine, always been a really, really important thing. Morale is frequently important. You'll find a lot of attempts over the years uh, to try to crack that that little interesting tidbit of how to keep fighting people willing to fight. Mm -hmm. Because, sure, you can give them nice equipment and good food, or you can give them access to uh, certain entertainments, you know, like uh, the USO show program, which will bring people directly right. to a fob, you know, to have stand-up comedians or musical acts or, hell, even exotic dancers. And that was um, going all the way back to, like, World War One and, and, like, earlier maybe, right? Yeah. No, the thing that's funny is there's also other attempts to get your fighting men and women uh, to to be motivated. Uh, one of the things I do point out is a certain uh, Corsican artillery officer uh, mm -hmm. by the name of Napoleon. <laughs> did, I, if I do remember correctly, he had stated that, you know, his men used to drink wine when marching. And I'm not sure if you've ever worn a period all wool uniform. Um, not comfortable. Uh, I mean, Marine Corps dress blues. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just, just imagine marching in that with your kid. Oh for yeah, miles and miles and miles. And he found out that when they drank wine, while that did keep the morale up, it it certainly didn't make them um, well, well effective. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so and and they would be hung over. So the next day marching was very unpleasant. Um, he was one of the people who was a proponent of just hey, what if we got them some hash or. <laughs> Just other stuff <laughs> to try to figure this out. Um, and you'll find that even further back in militaries, you find a lot of things being done where you look at the age of sail and mm -hmm. you find that there are many musicians on board ships. There are many great storytellers in naval service. And you find even further, you know, you cut people in for a cut of the prize money. So you turn the danger of war into an adventure. And, and I... you do do what you can to change the aspects of it oh man the age of sale must have been like i every i love the age of sale like conceptually and historically but every time i look into like sailors and naval crews and marines in the age of sale i'm like nope i i want nothing to do with that man like that, that it what a life a, <laughs> it would have been a hard life but those people, believe it or not, even very low-ranking sailors in the Royal Navy were quite wealthy compared to landlubbers. 
they <laughs> you got prize money. So mm -hmm. if you seize something, I mean, imagine being in the military and you capture, you know, some dictator's uh, giant pile of gold in his Mercedes and the U.S. government cutting you a check for a portion of that. Yeah, I know that That's that was how it used to be. I remember reading, um, oh, what was the book? Raiders of the Raiders of the Deep Sea, I think. The one that was about the, the German U-boat cruise. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, and I remember there was a large section there where they were talking about the U-boat cruise and, like, how they would oftentimes uh, get stuff from the ships that they were, you know, they, were really, uh, they would be like, oh, we're not going to shoot you down, or you couldn't for legal reasons later in the war. And they would just take stuff. Like, a lot of it was food and stuff, because, God, U-boats and decent yeah. rations and stuff but they also had like a lot of really interesting i guess loot is probably the, the best term here well, but war prize yeah war trophies yes. yeah loot it, it typically <laughs> was loot because when you look at transport ships typically you're stealing from a civilian crew yeah so a that, merchant that vessel just, yeah yeah that would just be good old-fashioned loot but yeah. i mean the military has tried a lot of different things i do know that in world war ii of course uh soldiers were shipped uh all sorts of board games mm -hmm. so they would get little micro versions of like monopoly they would get little uh chess sets or checkers sets that you could uh fasten to your leg while you're riding in a jeep and you could play those games. And I know that they, they did everything possible to include USO shows where it was safe and prudent to do so, to bring people in and, uh, of course, let them have a normal entertainment experience, as normal as the circumstances allowed. Well, that raises, that that's a interesting point. Do you think that it was the normality of just going to a show that was such a big part of it? Or do you think it was... Um the fact that it was a whole big to do because it's hard for me as a as a marine veteran really to think about like which one was what my higher ups were really focusing on were they trying to uh, institute a level of normality or were they trying to be like look we're doing a whole big fancy thing for you and historically I think, which little, one... I think it's a little bit of both i think mm -hmm. that it is ideally you want to bring some civility to an mm -hmm. uncivil place i like that but the the issue is as well with it. Um, not all USO shows are created equal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, tell me. <laughs> so you will have them say, "Hey, you guys like you guys like music, right?" And you're like, "Yeah, yeah, we got music." And they're like, "Well, you guys like classic rock, right?" And you're in your head, you're hearing, "Oh man, are they gonna get a ZZ Top?" And they're like, "We got <laughs> Night Ranger." And you're like, "Oh." <laughs> You know, uh, no, no insult to people who are Night Ranger fans, but I'm saying that is <laughs> the typical U.S. military response to USO. They'll be like, hey, do you guys like the Drew Carey show? And everyone goes, oh, my God, Drew Carey's going to be here. And they're like, no, the lady who played Mimi will be. And you're like, <laughs> oh, uh, you know, it's, yeah. it's like having a, a bad dad who says, I'll get you a bike. And then he just gives you like a drawing of a bike. <laughs> 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 I'll take you out to the ball game and takes you to his bar with his friends so you can watch it on the TV. Correct. It's, I mean, the military is trying, um, and I think that's what most people recognize. And having that break in civility where you can actually have a moment of sanity and an otherwise insane time to restore that normality for just a little bit, to bring just a touch of civility and kindness and an otherwise unkind time is largely the main effectiveness of these. I volunteered for uh, not, quite a few uh, programs, done quite a bit of my own fundraising mm -hmm. um, for military charities. Oh, yeah, and uh, I see underneath your videos all the time, like, lots and lots of money. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, Well, I'm a product of the War on Terror, and mm -hmm. so I think all of us who are our age are products of the War on Terror. We either saw 9-11 or... Oh, yeah, I can still remember friends. exactly where I was. Exactly. Like, it's a watershed moment for our generation. And so that makes us all products of that war. Even if you did not serve, even if you did not wear a uniform, that war has changed your perception of the world and has certainly shaped the years in which you've lived in it. Yeah, I was going to say, not just your perception, it changed the world. Like, <laughs> Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, and if you doubt that, go ahead and look at how easy it used to be to get on an airplane mm -hmm. before then. The eight, there was an age before the TSA. I was gonna, I was gonna say, like, I think a lot of people, especially younger folks. I mean, I'll, I'll age myself. I'm early thirties. I, I, I talked to some friends of mine, especially 
VTubers trend to, to the younger ages who are like late teens, early 20s, and they don't quite comprehend that the TSA is less than one generation old. A lot of right. people can remember the TSA being formed. You used to be able to bring things on an airplane. You used <laughs> to actually be able to go people watch in an airport. Mm -hmm. You used to be able to, you know, not have to like drink your baby shampoo or whatever before you got <laughs> on the plane. This is 4.1 so, ounces. That's one, 0.1 ounce too much. That's yeah. <laughs> that's, God. And so it did change that whole era. And having seen many of my friends go off to serve and come back changed or come back diminished or not come back, mm -hmm. I realized the importance of doing your part to help people. And for those who do not know, Small kindnesses are all that is required. You don't have to raise a half a million dollars. You don't have to raise $500. But to be that kind person, to be that kind voice, that reminder that someone indeed has value, aside from their military service, someone indeed has value as a fellow citizen of your nation, and that their suffering is unfortunate, but it is understood, mm -hmm. and that you are there as a reminder that there are still good times, there are still good possibilities, and there's still quite possibly good outcomes. And to be that guiding force, that guardrail, you can prevent a lot of bad things from happening by just caring a little bit. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely accurate. And I, I want to specifically drill down to one thing that you said there, which was the being the reminder that there are good things there. And I think that that, a lot of what, I wanted to talk about here, which, you know, I'm not trying to throw the conversation, but like this idea about using entertainment to really raise troop morale, I think that does a lot of that, you know, reminding people that there are good things, reminding people, hey, there's fun times. Not every single day is going to be this brutal patrol outside the wire. Like, you'll be able to come back, you'll be able to see a show with your loved ones, you'll be able to play these games, hang out, you know, there are fun things, not everything is terrible. Oh, I agree. Uh, does so I, much. Yeah. And and what's what's fascinating is going back into history, you said like little small acts of kindness. You can find in in soldiers' journals from every war throughout all of history examples of the smallest little kindness, the the littlest letter from home, or even in some cases, you know, kindnesses visited upon them by opposing forces. You know, um there's there's some instances throughout history of like uh, hey, you know, I expected to be treated so terribly as a prisoner of war, but it was like I got decent food and treated like a human being, which s s to us, to a lot of people, seems like, yeah, of course that's the thing. But when you're in that situation, you're not always expecting that. And like that Indeed. little kindness of like, hey, I see you. I know you're struggling. Here's a chocolate bar. It doesn't seem like much, but it does so many things. And like, I'm wondering... If there's any examples that really pop to mind to you of these moments uh, in your readings of like uh, specific stories uh, that you've heard of, of like either opposing forces treating each other incredibly like in, in a way that really just raised morale enormously or like uh, if you've read anything during the age of sale, like little things that people have, uh, have found. Well, the thing that's kind of interesting is it it always varies, obviously, because mm -hmm. for every person who does a nice act of kindness, there are people who are just dicks. So, you know, they'll throw yeah, uh, food course. out in no man's land in World War One, And then as the starving soldiers go for it, they they'll throw shoot grenades. Yeah. You know, that, that happens, unfortunately, quite a bit. But if you look at the Great War, uh, where Europe got a little interesting for a while. <laughs> a little spicy. <laughs> yeah, it was, it, was a, it was an interesting time. Um, and Austro-Hungary is to blame for some of it. But the, you'll find that when, <laughs> when all of this kicks off, in the first bits of the war, everyone is trying to figure out what an industrialized war looks like. Nobody really has an idea other than I can put more guns on the ground and I can make mountains of shells. Yeah, and because now it's now it's true. machine guns. Like now yeah. it's now it's like Lewis guns and stuff like that when historically. Well, machine was... guns had been employed rather successfully for about thirty years prior to that war. The difference was is that it went from the battalion has a few machine guns to the platoon has a few machine guns. Right. And so that idea of 
all of a sudden you can make something that was seen as an extension of an artillery battery into something that is a man portable weapon system, yeah. something you can take over there at point blank range and do some work. Now, the, the taking thing anything, taking anything from a battalion level asset and turning it into a platoon or even squad level asset is a, a huge shift in scale. Yes. So mm, the thing that really stands out to me, and I know it's very um, blase, I guess, to mm -hmm. kind of bring it up is the Christmas truce. You find that when these guys have been fighting for just a bit and they realize we are in line of sight of each other and this has been so horrific with round-the-clock shelling, then all of a sudden on Christmas, they're like, you know what? What if we just don't kill each other today? Yeah, what if we just maybe play some tomorrow, soccer, share our cigarettes? Maybe, yeah, yeah, maybe tomorrow, but not today. And so you'll find that, that as Shakespeare put it, the the milk of human kindness does shine through sometimes. There are cases in World War II where wounded and murdered up uh, B-17s hanging by tatters are escorted out of airspace by German fighters. They don't have to do that, but they're doing it because they're like, look, I'm not going to shoot a wounded man. Yeah, you know you were beat. You're not a threat. I'm going to help you get home. You know, Right. I'll see you next time. Not everyone's a monster in war. War does make many people into monsters, but not everyone is a monster at war. Uh, uh, yeah, and as a veteran, I think that that's that's one of those things that really impresses me more. You know, there's there's so many people that really hype up the whole oh they're they're a monster in combat, they're a beast, blah blah blah, and that is impressive to be to like be able to stack bodies and take heads. But at the same time, I think maintaining your humanity and your ability to empathize with your fellow man is almost in many ways more impressive and more laudable you know well in the way the way that should shine through because i know some people are very much amped up over the take no prisoners yeah. sort of nonsense but the thing is is that and i i do feel that this is something americans need to learn uh is you're not always going to win every single war or every yeah. single battle yeah. And even though we have the strategic Leviathan, we've learned a few harsh lessons over the last many years, uh, from the Afghanistan pullout to, um, you know, the Intifada and many other things. I mean, even stretching back to Vietnam, you're talking about Indeed. the difference between, you know, the, the military juggernaut that is the U.S. military industrial complex compared. And, and you remember as well as I do how often they're like, look at all of the guns and the technology that we have. And then, you know, not to not to. Uh, break things down too simply, but getting beaten by farmers with old rifles that have been passed down three generations. Well, you... and the point is, is even if you don't win, if you go through and you treat people in a humane manner, when your guys lose, they're not going to get murdered. Mm -hmm. You treat people they... kindly, you get treated kindly. More or less. That is the golden rule. Yeah. And it's why it's kind of funny, even in Battletech, one of the great sins I point out of the clanners is uh, they presumed the people they were fighting were barbarians. And that is kind of a mistake. That is actually a very common military mistake, is usually for the sake of propaganda, you try to dehumanize your opponents. You try to say, you exaggerate all of the worst aspects of them. Well, right, because you're trying to justify what you're planning to do. Oh, yeah. I mean, you. it's very easy to say you're going to drop bombs on people who are monsters. It's very difficult to say, hey, that guy's got a mom. Yeah. And I remember that was one of them, I believe it was Way of the Dragon. That was when um, uh, Jamie Wolf was spared by uh, Theodore Carita, right? Was I it Theodore so. Carita? Uh it's no. one of the Kuritas. Yeah, it's it was one, one of the, the Kuritas. Uh, that it, uh, Jamie Wolf was there in his in his archer, and he was all torn apart after wiping out like I think like two lances by himself or something. And uh, he comes up and he says, "Hey, you're beat." Like over his externals, he's like, "You're beat, but I'm not gonna kill. Uh, I'm not gonna kill a man when he's down. Go ahead, get out of here. Fight me like a warrior later." And like that started. It, I mean, Jamie Wolf had his problems with the Kurita line for very good reasons, but like uh, I think that started him being willing to talk to Theodore Carita later and like understanding that like not everyone is the worst example of their demographic. 
you know? Well, of course. It's one of those things that I think that the modern world has kind of suffered from, especially as an aftermath of COVID, where people uh, got a lot more time indoors by themselves than they probably wanted. And one of the casualties of that is people are constantly looking to be attacked or to attack someone else. Mm -hmm. Um, And I, I find that everyone is presuming that someone who disagrees with them means ill by it. Or someone who dislikes you means ill by it. And it's like, oh they may God. just dislike what you're doing at that moment. You know, like if, if my neighbor knocks my garbage can over, I may start swearing. But that does not mean I wish them dead. The same applies in a maximal case to the U.S. military or people's experiences at war. A lot of people have a hard problem with disconnecting from moments of necessary, at times sadly, violence. And then the value of that as a human being outside of it. Because someday the war will end. And the hate that kept you alive in that moment, the anger that propelled you to act in that moment, is not going to last for the rest of your life in a positive manner to keep you alive. And it shouldn't. That's, you know, that would be unhealthy. (laughs) Very unhealthy. It's why a lot of people have trouble letting go. Mm -hmm. Um, It's much the same way with anyone who's ever been in a fight they're looking for the next fight Mm -hmm. because maybe they didn't start it or maybe it happened just to them. And so they don't know how to react in that. And so being able to rehumanize yourself, to step back and see a healing path and to realize that people are people and bad things happen to good people, but that's not a surety. And that's not something that happens all the time. A great deal of the mistakes I feel we make are not in allowing ourselves to be friends to ourselves. We find that we are our own worst critic. And quite frequently, we find that this scared person is afraid of being hurt again. And so it makes it very easy to disconnect and presume the whole world's out to get you. Yeah, and I always try to I always try to reinforce to people the idea that disagreement and conflict does not always mean hostility. Well, no. You're going to be able to... Like, one of the best examples I'll give is you can all like something and disagree on its execution. So, like, let's say I'm ordering pizza, right? And I go, okay, I'll order pizza, but the catch is you all have to agree on the toppings. <laughs> You'll find that everyone loves the idea of pizza. Not everyone loves the idea of pineapple on pizza. Right. And I mean, uh, bringing this back to a mutual interest that we share, you can talk about Battletech, too. I mean, oh, sure. you could have so you can have me, you, Mechfrog, Big Red. You could have all of us in a big room and we all look at each other. We all say Battletech's great. Right. And we all sure. nod and say, yeah, thumbs up. Battletech's great. And then you, you open the floor and you say, what about Battletech is great? And you'll get 14 different answers. You know, well, and that's that's the thing I like about Battletech is you can play whatever era you want. You know, it's it's not like use the latest rule for X or go fuck yourself. Right. That's what's great about Battletech is you can go. I like thirty twenty five. Yeah, okay. I'll be the first person to admit that I play uh, Helm Core up to Clan Invasion almost exclusively. So yeah, and a lot of a lot of people play that, and there's some people who like just the new stuff because they like all the cool quirky text that come with that. And, Good power to them. Mm-hmm. I just think that a lot of people as well over the past many years, and this is certainly in, in true of the veteran community, you find a lot of people have lost the ability to communicate openly from a place of vulnerability. Because there are strictures on how you're supposed to behave, act, or what have you, and talking about conflict is such a difficult endeavor. It's difficult Violence to admit sucks. that you it's difficult to admit that you were vulnerable. Especially Indeed. especially for military veterans when so much of the culture and I'm speaking from experience, so much of that culture is I need to be strong, I need to be rugged and durable and infallible. And the the uh, the the pressures to refuse to admit that you might not be infallible and that you need help in some way is is immense. Well, that's why role-playing games are such a wonderful way of doing that. Mm-hmm. Because you can go out there and play 
a different person. You can adopt different ways and mindsets and lenses of the world. And you can live through that and share that with other people who are similarly going out on a limb and being vulnerable and being weird and playing a character they like. And that is a really good way of healing. I've found that as an autistic person, role-playing games and battle tech games and tabletop games gave me the necessary tools to become a social being where normally that would be the most terrifying concept, considering how very ugly people can be in social situations, especially to people who are awkward mm -hmm. for no sin of their own. It just is that way. And, and so role-playing games are incredible for that. Which is why I love the fact that Stack Up, the charity that I worked with, actively tries to push that very specific thing of like, look, you are used to socializing in a very specific way. We're going to use role playing as a method to explore other ways to socialize or uh, in terms of therapy, explore... Um, you know the the traumas that you have had to deal with and i i've you know i i make no attempt to hide the fact that i you know have a therapist i've seen therapy i think more people should i think that the world would be healthier for it and i've seen so many therapists that are now they're using like the term gamifying but using role-playing games and like structured settings like that to explore trauma and to to help manage mental health difficulties whether that be autism like like i am uh, from what you said you as uh, well have or trauma from like uh, historical events or any other form of social uh, difficulty it's it's such a wonderful avenue and i'm so glad that more places are exploring using it same and i i think it's a tool that unfortunately we ran through uh in in the era i was young when this was still kind of going on and it mostly petered out by the time I started playing role-playing games, but there was that, of course, moral satanic panic oh, <laughs> of Dungeons and Dragons. You know, uh, everyone everyone presumed that by playing a bit of D and D, you were selling your soul to dark and fell powers. And uh, now it's mainstream. Mm -hmm. Now this now this nerd shit is just boring mainstream. Like, Which is great. Oh, yeah, D and D. You know. Yeah, you'll run into people who have three generations of their family who play D and D, and so now that we have that gift, and that is a gift, we should use it. Mm -hmm. And I find that more people should play tabletop games, more people should play role playing games, because when you can cast aside any differences you have and just roll some fucking dice, things are fun. Oh yeah, and and I think I I I'm strongly of the belief, and I say this all the time. That there is a role-playing game out there everyone will enjoy. Everyone hears role-playing game and the first thing they think of every time is D&D. &D. And I have strong opinions about D&D. &D, uh, but this is not the point of this interview. Well, I, I, this think, I think everyone has strong opinions about various <laughs> editions of D&D. &D. Anyone who's played D&D &D has some very <laughs> serious opinions <laughs> over edition wars and... Oh, Forgotten uh, Realms versus Remembered Realms. Oh, uh, with and... Faerun. Yeah, whether you're doing Galarian with Pathfinder, 3.5 versus 5e. Yeah, but like my, the point I was going to make is, is that everyone goes to the Swords and Sorcery D20, right? But there's so, so many different tabletop RPGs out there. You know, you want something that's a little bit more, more sci-fi? You've got Dark Heresy and all of the Warhammer 40k ones that are out there. I mean, you've got Cyberpunk, uh, Cyberpunk Red that's out there. Um, you've got Traveler. I don't know if you've ever looked into Traveler. You should. You would love Traveler. I, I have a Traveler campaign on my podcast. It's, uh, oh, I've it's played, so good. I've, I've talked I don't know with how Mark I've missed Miller. that, actually. I've, I've talked with Mark Miller. He's a cool guy. Traveler's character um, creation? Best one in the industry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, down. Traveler, a friend of mine put Traveler's character creation and the whole game as uh, it really well summed it up. Said it's a midlife crisis simulator <laughs> because you're in a space environment and it's the story of why you became a spacer. And typically it's the first, second, and third job didn't work out. You did a little bit of time in prison for moving some meth and, you know. Uh, you didn't. You got lost on the way to your higher calling. But well, yeah. Anyways, it's time to make some money. Yeah, it's like fuck it. I've got a gun. I've got a can-do attitude. Let's go. And um, but or, and even if you don't like conflict, like I mean, there's there's monster hearts out there. Uh, there's 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 and if you like the more the more 
you know, narrative story. Like, you've got all of the white wolf, like vampire and werewolf. Oh, yeah. and all this kind of stuff. I mean, that's, that's all theater of the mind. Exactly. I mean, and, and I, yeah, absolutely. And I love the fact that like, there's, there's you more like, I'm just supporting what you say. Everyone should play more TTRPGs. And if you don't like the swords and sorcery stuff, I encourage you to not, uh, for those listening, I encourage you not to think that that means tabletop RPGs aren't for you. It just means that tabletop RPG isn't for you. Oh, indeed. Like, I've known people who play a lot of Seventh C, where they go around and you play as pirates during, mm -hmm. or not a, not exactly pirates, you can do anything, but during the Age of Sail, the Golden Century. Which is such and, a great place to roleplay in. Such an yeah. am amazing setting. Oh, yeah. And it, there's all these options. And the other thing that's important is you don't even have to worry about canon. There's homebrew. You can just go... Wouldn't it be neat if, and then cut whole parts out of a game mm -hmm. or make whatever the fuck you want? It's not a big deal. I mean, there's a solid argument that that's what D20 and D&D specifically lives off of. I don't know yeah. anyone that plays D&D &D rules is written 100% out of the book. I, like, I know one person who did, but they would frequently say this. Uh, they were like, I knew Guy Gax and it's what he wanted. And I'm like, oh, I, 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 don't, oh. I don't think that's true. But And also yeah. like debatable on whether or not that's relevant, you know? <laughs> like, but Grognards is going to be Grognards, yeah. and that's fine, because Grognards can find other Grognards and then play Grognard-heavy games like uh, Twilight 2000. <sighs> Twilight 2000, don't drink that water. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, I would even say, talking about Grognard stuff, uh, the difference between classic Battletech slash Total War and Alpha Strike. I mean, me and you are big, like, uh, I imagine that, you know, you... I'm not going to say you prefer, but you're very familiar with with tabletop uh, battle yeah. tech and all that kind of stuff. And I've seen so many people that are like, I don't want to get near, you know, the old, like, 80s FASA rules and stuff like that because it's so old school as opposed to Alpha Strike, which plays fast and is a more modern game. And, like, neither of these is better than the other, but, like, it, it, it's, it's... different. Yeah, and it's nice to see them being able to connect together. Uh, but connecting back to what you said before about using tabletop RPGs to deal with trauma and to to explore yourself uh i i'm absolutely aware that this is not a thing that you're you know personally experienced with but myself i make no qualms about the fact that i am uh a trans woman i'm very open about that and i can tell you so many uh, queer people i know have used tabletop rpgs as like well my character i'm role playing a girl here right and like that's their subtle way of being like, really, let me explore this. And I'm not going to ask you to dip into that because I know that's not a subject that you want to touch, but looping back around to the idea of like, it's such a great way for you to be able to be like, I want to explore an aspect of myself or something that I think I want to discuss. And I'm going to make my character that, you know? I think that's kind of a fun part of role-playing games is to play whatever you want and to explore stuff. I mean, like, let's say you go out in your day-to-day -day life and you have to be a goody two-shoes because of your responsibilities or whatever, then you can play a role-playing game and play, you know, kill, fuck, soul shitter, yeah, the then, ultimate bastard. Then you could load up New Vegas and play a Legion yeah. run, you know? Like... Exactly. Exa and that's the fun of it. It's, it's learning to play the other side. It's learning to read through those things. And, and, and yeah. And getting to, you know, earlier we were talking about the, the, the Christmas truce. I think that uh, that boils down to the idea of empathy and understanding the other side of things. And I think there is value in exploring, putting yourself in the other person's shoes. Then uh, role playing lets you do that. You know, the ability to say, well, I personally don't support this people that do X, Y and Z. Right. I, I don't like this mindset. I'm going to role play it because it's a it's a fun role playing character and any decent DM will give you the opportunity to say, OK, well, let's explore the nuances of what that represents. And it can give you even if it's not making you support that view set that viewpoint, it can give you an understanding and understanding sure. is is. I, I, and, and we talked uh, before the, the recording started, we talked about that. We should talk about guns and stuff uh, at some point. Uh, this isn't a tangent, I swear. Understanding is always super important because even if you're anti-gun, I feel more people should understand guns, right? Like, oh, I, uh, and, I, yeah, absolutely. And, and that extends to social stuff too. You don't have to agree or like something, but ignorance shouldn't be where that comes from. 
Your disagreement with something yeah. shouldn't be because you don't understand it. It should be because and you I understand think, it and you don't like it. I think everyone should have gun education, even if they are anti-gun ownership, because I think if you come across a gun, you should be able to render it safe. Oh, 100%. Like, indoors, pressing the indoors button. <laughs> right. And so I think that that is kind of a key thing, is that everyone should have a good amount of education on a subject. Now, I'm not going to discuss politics or gun rights right, with people of or what have you, because everyone is entitled to their own free opinion, and everyone should be more than acceptable to disagree with someone in a very polite and respectful manner. You know, attack the idea, not the person. And the thing is, is when it comes down to education, though, education that saves lives and keeps people safe should be universal. Oh, that 100%. education should be universal. Like, you may not be a gun person, but you should have an education on, wow, I found a gun. Let's make this safe. Let's remove yeah. the magazine. How to and clear take the a fire out of the pipe. Yeah. Exactly. And I, I think that that is sane. That's very, very sane. But we also live in an era where people are quite frequently uh, driven to say, well, if you don't agree with me on this one point, that means you're an X. And they just bring out the worst X they can find to call you some sort of, you know, name whatever that name may be, whatever they think will offend you the most or whatever they fear the most to paint you as. Mm -hmm. And I find that, I believe in something that Edward R. Murrow said, one of, our, one of our best journalists of all time, who said that we need to be able to have the difficult conversations. I think that that is free, to be able to have a difficult conversation in a way that's respectful and honest and decent. And like, like you said, understanding and, and having those conversations is so important because regardless of your social, like, uh, again, I'm not just like you, I don't want to touch on specific politics or social issues, sure. but I think, I think that the inability for two people on opposite sides of the aisle to say, okay, why do you believe this? Why do you feel this way? Let's have a reasonable conversation about it. It, and, and like find even if you can't find an agreement at the very least both of you come across uh, come away with an understanding of what the subject matter is indeed it, and it, how it impacts people if you if you you should never outright refuse to listen to another person so long as that person is willing to have like obviously if someone is just being an asshole to you Right, well, sure. like, because yeah, and as as an LGBT individual myself, like there, like there are absolutely people who, like, this doesn't apply to you because the only thing they're trying to do is be hurtful, right? But I think that that kind of proves the point, right? Because what they're trying to do is just be hurtful. They're not trying to understand or talk or anything. Uh, people need to really be willing to say, okay, we can disagree on this. But I'm still going to respect you as an individual, and I'm not going to try to be a piece of shit, you know? Well, right. And it's it's one of those things that I think I saw really start to become very much a hot-button issue during COVID. A mm -hmm. lot of people had a lot of in, like, online The anti-masking stuff and yeah. all that. Yeah. We, well, we had a lot of online time. And, you know, maybe, maybe prior to that, people going out in the world having some real experiences was a bit more hmm, worldly. It allowed people to be to experience more of the world, not hear things second or third hand, or just to hear the talking points. Uh, but the issue is with the modern age of the internet is you end up with what's called the bullhorn effect, mm -hmm. where you or I could be having a conversation on any number of subjects. And you and I are just having this polite and wonderful conversation, but thanks to the uh, places like Reddit or Twitter or what have you, if someone is very popular comes in and changes the subject, that's someone walking into a party with a bullhorn. Now, regardless of the conversation that you or I were having and how much we enjoyed the conversation, even if we disagreed, we're now going to have to respond to that bullhorn because that is screaming at full volume in the room and filling it with noise. Oh, Everyone God. in the room is suddenly talking about that subject. You see this and with that the subject only. You see that with the culture war stuff all over 
all of the hobbies that we share. Uh, well, it's it is the way it is. I yeah. mean, I I think that's more just a symptom of the uncertainty of our times, because if everything was very certain and like we didn't have massive rampant inflation oh, yeah. and the economy wasn't spooking us out a little bit. I think that most people would have nothing to complain about, but the uncertain hmm. times we live in, certainly with the state of global affairs makes everyone very nervous. And if, if people have plentiful jobs, plenty of money in their pockets and plenty of things to look forward to, you're not going to have people react so negatively over what I find to be largely inconsequential pieces of information. So with the way the world is going, I, I really think that we as human beings can do the most service by just being kind. You don't have to love everybody. In fact, I'd probably encourage you not to because <laughs> you'll get taken advantage of. But you can be kind to everyone. And that isn't that hard, really. It's not that hard at all to be kind. Which... I think is a good opportunity to loop back around to the original reason, because I love the fact that me and you can talk so easily and just go off on these, you know, you know, casual strolls through discussion. But sure. uh, I did want to uh, to bring this right back to the original point that I was making, which was uh, veteran support and gaming and stuff for that. And I think that, you know, you talking about kindness uh, is is a great way to loop to the idea of charity. Uh, you mentioned a while back uh, about the idea that you don't have to do a big thing, right? I raised $450 for the charity. You've raised 10 times that easily. It, but at the end of the day, a lot of little kindnesses add up to a really big kindness. And I well, think sure. that... Well, um, sure. Absolutely. It's, it's just the fact of saying, I haven't forgotten you, and I'm thinking of you. A <laughs> little bit of compassion. And I would... I. I would wonder if you have uh, i know you mentioned before that you're private so you know you feel free to tell me to you know pound sand but do you have any specific examples of um gaming uh that you have seen either either towards yourself or to people that you know uh gaming being something to help with a really difficult life situation um, I can think of a certain handful of cases, um, especially uh, after the Afghan uh, pullout. A lot of my friends who DM certainly made uh, every effort to make sure people, you know, had something to do and could have fun with it. I, I do also remember quite a few people running military games like Dark Heresy, where obviously it is a very grim, dark universe. And especially if you play Only War, you know, the, the uh, guard version of that oh game. yeah i was gonna say i played a dark heresy campaign that was like everyone had no one is allowed to be anything other than like a guardsman administratum or tech priest you yeah, know everyone's like, gonna die but if you let people have their moment of heroism and you you let people play these characters that are essentially action heroes it does something to somebody it lets them feel like they're not alone or it makes them feel like they can self-assert and i've seen a lot of those cases especially in rpgs really work out for folks mm -hmm. the other thing is kind of interesting especially in video games um you'll find a lot of people play squad you'll find a lot of people uh play arma who were in the military who were deployed who did go down range and were in very violent situations playing these games with their friends as a way of just letting loose, but also showing their friends how they work in these situations, taking charge and being a protector. It's And it's kind of interesting that way. It's really funny you say that because uh, when Helldivers 2 was getting really, really big um, and everyone was playing it, myself included, one of the things that constantly came up was people were talking about, you know, be aware if you're getting night scale into your Helldivers game, because if you play difficulty seven, then it becomes a real, like, you are not just, yeah, liberty blowing everything up. It becomes a real struggle. Like, I, it became known in my group of friends, like, I immediately go into, like, NCO mode. And people, yeah. people were talking about the fact, that, like, oh, shit, we can really see that you were a corporal before you got out, because, like you know, small squad unit leadership, like you're setting, you know, you hold up position over there. I need you to go over here and activate that object, you know, that kind of thing. And it's, it's, it's 
really interesting that I'm not the only one that had that experience uh, and that you've seen that as well of like people who are in the military using this as an opportunity to show like, these are my skill sets. This is what I do. You know? Right. And in a positive manner where they can also serve as a protector, mm -hmm. it's bringing that power back into a self-actualized manner that is positive, positive leadership. Yeah. And that's something that really does help, I feel. And I think that's that's one of the reasons why Stack Up does so well with uh, their using of RPGs and gaming in this is is that self uh, that self actualization. Uh, words words are hard when I haven't had enough coffee. Uh, is that um, agency that it really uh, pushes back in? And I think agency is really the thing that needs to be drilled down into there, uh, because so much throughout all of history of military service is is loss of control. You can't control the things that are happening to you. There's so much that like. You can control your actions, but so many variables around you. And oh, indeed. Being... And, yeah. I mean, part of the military experience is accepting the suck. Oh. Things, <laughs> yeah. things are beyond your control. They will continue to be beyond your control. And you will be lucky if people remember your name. And to take that agency back and to self-determine a bit and to have something of your character be reflected in a fun little game where the greatest obstacle is boredom, not actual violence, and to be a provider of insight and wisdom in a supportive environment is, again, a positive change, a positive environment, and it gives people a chance to heal, or at the very least, kind of help bridge that gap between their friends who suppose what they do versus what they actually do. Because I think many people have a color of conflict that is certainly conflated by television oh yeah i mean and it's there's so much about television it's like this makes for great entertainment but not accurate representation well of uh, course it's like <laughs> you can't make a action movie where the marines stand around for um three days drinking rippets and making dick jokes I mean, because I, the general public isn't going to like that. They I mean, want to see the door kicking. They want to see yeah. the badass. You know, I, I tell people all the time. I was like, I, w I was artillery, right? Like, and uh, people say all the time, "Thank you for your service." I was like, most of my service was sitting on a gun line miles away, taking a nap or talking about whether Goku or Saitama would win with like the rest of the Marines. Like, it wasn't it wasn't really exciting shit. Like, you know, um, and I I I think that. Uh, the the representation stuff is fascinating from a military point of view uh but getting back to the idea of um entertainment uh being used as a way to deal with this kind of stuff and and form cohesion like we were talking about a little bit ago uh, you can find these examples even in modern times of people who got into 40k or got into battletech or got into D D because they were in the suck right during like desert storm or like desert shield or the gulf war or, or even nam and like one of their friends was like hey i've got this old ratty player's handbook or like this old copy of like battletech and stuff i i, I remember very specifically uh seeing a picture of someone that was uh in an fob when the generator had died after a mortar strike and everyone was kind of like, we don't know what to do. This is boring. You know, we've got our quick reaction team ready. We've got the people on patrol, the people that are at rest. We can't do anything because we have no power. And one dude was like, well, I've got this old copy of Battletech. Battletech doesn't need like actual uh, minis. Uh, we can make little, dr like, little drawn out mechs here and draw a hex grid. And they taught themselves how to play Battletech using that. And like I, I, I love the fact that this entertainment and these these games have always been a part of like managing uh, me like the difficulties and the social connections in military stuff. Well, indeed. I mean, for the longest time, the soldier's friend was a deck of cards or oh, something yeah. very simple. But now people have a lot of choices. And I've seen... A lot of people who went to war and said, oh, you know, I was on a ship for a year and a half and I played, you know, eight Magic the Gathering campaigns, <laughs> you know, and there's people who do that. There's I knew people who went off to war on an aircraft carrier 
and said that, oh, yeah, you know, I've got three separate D&D groups broken down by division. <laughs> so, you know, there's the engine room game and then there's the flight line game. It, it That reminds me of, um, there was something on, I know, I know you're infamously uh, social media abstinence, but there was a Twitter post that I really liked that I think you would enjoy of a, a soldier that had gotten all of his uh, uh like his close squad into D and their platoon uh their platoon commander who's you know just some second lieutenant first lieutenant uh stopped by and was like i heard that you guys are doing a team building exercise uh let's uh, let me sit in and see if it's you know applicable and he did and he ended up joining the group and the thing that was really funny was when they wanted to uh do a session on that monday but none of them can get off of like the basic you know military life stuff that second lieutenant drafted orders for them and like they posted the picture with obviously all the relevant details blanked out for you know opsec but it was like no these we got orders that like we have to do a team building exercise and all five of these names are just our D D group yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> like they got ordered to play D D. <laughs> and that's the fun of it is it's positive it helps you get to know people and it also, it's one of those things where creative problem solving does wondrous things for the mind. Wondrous things for the mind. Oh, and yeah. creative problem solving is hilarious because it allows people to absolutely just, I mean, good God, go look up D&D's Peasant Railgun. <laughs> You'll <laughs> find all of these really fun ideas that are only going to come out in a tabletop game. Or the fact that I think it was second edition drowning, like the drowning state. Oh, barbarian. Yeah, the drowning state technically didn't allow you to die until the drowning state ended and you died from drowning. And there was the whole like stasis thing of putting a bucket over your head and filling it with water. Because as long as you were only drowning but not drowned, you couldn't die. I remember Correct. I remember things like that. Yeah. yeah. 3.5 and... specifically had a ton of that, but. Oh yeah. Well, that's the fun of that's the fun of tabletop, though. The fun of tabletop is being able to explore the world with your friends, and you can define the world around your actions, and you can be a hero or a villain or whatever you feel like fucking being. And mm -hmm. that's the wonder of it. And it is not surprising at all to me to find so many people have found restful healing through the exploration of tabletop games and, and self discovery. Well, it is. The other thing that is really interesting is that for the longest time, people dismiss such things as, oh, just goofing off. But we've, in the last 20 years, I'd say, built a very positive culture about RPGs. A very, very positive culture about RPGs, where once, yes, we did have the satanic panic and, oh, oh dear, the, all the pearl clutching of the world going on and burning down. And I think that now that that's gone and people see D&D as mainstream, it's built, again, a very positive reinforcement of good culture where anything's possible and playing tabletop is no different than playing a video game. Exactly. And it bridges so many gaps in social stuff in, and teaches, as you know, we talked earlier, it teaches people how to socialize and it allows people to socialize that would not necessarily ever imagine that they could socialize together because that is a thing that they can find together. I remember you told a story a little bit ago uh, on, I don't remember if it was your podcast or if it was uh, like a tangent on one of your campaigns. Uh, you told a story about growing up in, in the South and having like, you know, the, the, the dude in coveralls come down and be like, you kids playing D&D? &D? Yeah. Let me let me tell you about my barbarian, like and yeah, the strong hand. Yeah, and and like you know, most people wouldn't imagine this like late thirties, early forties dude who's every stereotype of like southern redneck kind of thing coming down and being like, I remember when I got a critical role against the Tarrasque and put it into the ground, you know? Like yeah, well, and that's the thing is, the fun thing about tabletop is I've met people who I would never presume they were tabletop role players. Mm -hmm. You know, you uh, uh, some... fucking um, uh, shit. What's his name? Uh, big muscular actor. Uh, uh Vin Diesel. Vin Diesel, yeah, Vin Diesel is yeah. a great example of that. Uh, yeah, and Henry because... Cavill, Henry Cavill being into forty k. Yeah, you know. Well, and that's that's the thing is like you never know who's gonna be a, a gamer, and that's what's great is we've lost. I would say. If we can be thankful for anything in tabletop wargaming, because, again, we've lost that stigma of where it was just very sad nerddom. 
Mm-hmm. You know, it was that was oh that sh- that's nerd shit. That's shit that nerds do. No, it's just mainstream. It's just a thing to do now. Yeah, and that adds so much to the enjoyment of it because it can be shared without issue. Which which is part of why it's so helpful to people who are used to a very specific form of socialization like veterans to be able to break out of that because it, it offers a structured alternative right like oh, I agree. Uh, and and i absolutely agree when when you know when you get out of you know even just a four-year contract but god forbid you re-enlisted i don't know i'm sorry if you did but yeah. <laughs> veteran joke society you know god forbid you spend four eight twelve sixteen years having these very specific social rules uh, whether they be uh, literally written uh, in terms of like how enlisted need to interact with officers or just unspoken in terms of like, you know, the enlisted lifestyle, um, the ability to come out of that and have like, OK, uh, you are now going to be interacting with people that are not used to or even necessarily familiar with those rules. Let me ease you back into interacting with these people uh, through a structured environment is so helpful and i can't tell oh, yeah. you how i can't tell you how many veterans i know that avoided the like there's there's a stereotype which is not unearned of like the weird veteran who all the only way they interact with people is 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 as if they are other soldiers marines sailors etc um and i can't tell you how many people i know personally that have avoided falling into that trap because they got into uh, a D&D group at the college that they went to using their GI Bill, right? And like, oh, yeah. it's, it's, it's so, it's so great to see charities that are starting to really push this as a, as a concept. And I think that those are definitely worthy charities because so many charities are just saying, oh, the poor people, they suffer without offering a way out. They just go, well, our job is to get them medical care. Well, medical care is one kind of care, certainly. But finding a means by which to remind yourself that you are not alone, that's a whole different kind of care altogether and equally as necessary. And not, not only uh, not alone, but there's a difference between, and I'm, I'm big into survivalism and like stuff like that, you know, apocalypse planning, shit like that. It's a hobby. Oh, sure. But like, and, and one thing that constantly comes up is the idea of there's a difference between surviving and living. And I think that, oh, there's, I think that there's a lot of charities that, and not to say that this is not an important and super laudable thing, there are a lot of charities that really focus on the surviving aspect. We're going to get people healthcare. We're going to get people the assistance that they need. But it's nice to see some charities like Stack Up that are like, okay, but we're also going to improve the quality of life. Agreed. We're also we're also going to make it so that not only do you have the healthcare, not only do you have the resources to survive, but you want to survive. You have a thing to look forward to. The one thing that I found in my charities that I've done. Um, I had a very good discussion with a man who had, we'd, we'd raised quite a sizable amount to help him. And he had said that one of the failing points of most military charities is they remind a veteran that they are a veteran. Mm -hmm. And he goes, I don't need that reminder. Mm -hmm. He said, the ones that really make a difference are those that remind him that they are a person. You, you will never forget your military service. I don't care how like what you did, I don't care how old you are, you will always remember wearing that uniform. The difficult thing, and we can see this throughout all of history, is reintegration and remind, reminding yourself that you are not just the uniform. And uh, it's it's s- ways to do that are are few and far between unless you're actively looking for them. And charities Indeed. that do that are so valuable, so valuable. I absolutely agree. I think that those those charities try to find a reminder of renewal of purpose. Now that the military service has ended, it doesn't mean you can't be of service to your fellow person. And and thing games like Helldivers, like TTRBGs. Uh, we talked about my example of my you know experience as an NCO allowing me to take small unit le- uh, small unit leadership instantly and naturally. Uh, tabletop RPGs allowing people to understand. Uh, something like an MOS, a specialization, and how to apply that to team building and effort and stuff is is applicable inside and out of those games. And it's it's really great way to show the talents and skills that you earned in the military can apply outside the military in a way that's 
not only constructive because there's you know dozens and dozens of like hey veterans let's get you a job using the skills you've earned but also fun you know in some cases well right and it's it's one of those things where i i think we can agree that you know we're not trying to shit on anyone who says that you know vocational help is important or what have you because all, uh, all these things are uh, very very important i mean i'm a, i'm an unemployed veteran you don't have to tell me vocational right. help is super you know they, it's, <laughs> but i i find that most people who focus only on the notion of vocational oh they got a job they'll be fine that's not the only support you can give oh, someone absolutely uh, not showing in the real core i think of the the goodness of these tabletop and gaming charities is you show somebody that they matter and they belong they don't just need a job they need purpose they need to belong they need to be okay around their fellow citizen and that is kind of lost on a lot of people because they take that for granted. They go, well, of course you belong. You don't know that until you have to leave civilization to help protect civilization and then have to suddenly reintegrate into civilization. Mm -hmm. Because time changes. The world moves on. And in the military, you are in a little bubble. And in that little bubble, things move at a different speed, at a different pace. One, one thing I pointed out was a friend of mine had gone on a big backpacking trip across, uh, across much, of the, much of the American Northwest. Mm -hmm. And as part of this, he had been without internet for about a month and a half, right? Mm -hmm. So he goes without internet for a month and a half, and he returns to the internet. And every five minutes, he sends me a DM and goes, what does this meme mean? <laughs> What is because Riz? He's been, like... yeah, he's, he's been disconnected for long enough to lose understanding of the common world. For veterans, it's this for years. And and, and, and society moves me. so and in, in, in the internet age, society moves so fast. Indeed. And so they feel isolated because all they have that they've shared is now with people that they don't live with anymore. And they have to reabsorb all this information. Mm -hmm. So being able to share a comfortable environment and story tell and help each other out is part of that bonding process of re-socializing. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not a psychotherapist, but it certainly helped me. And, and just because you're not a psychotherapist, just because, um, you know, your experiences might be different doesn't mean that they're not any less valid. Just toss that well, little bit fair. of validation out there for you. I just wanted to I just wanted to asterisk before anyone goes, wow, Tech sounds like he knows what he's talking about. I will assure you that I do not. And I, I can only speak for what I have seen. And I think that's actually a good uh, a good opportunity for me to because uh, we have been talking for about an hour and I don't want to keep you from too much. Even as much as I enjoy talking with you, uh, I do want to keep this a manageable time. I think that's a good opportunity. You said Tech knows what he's talking about and you want to reiterate that you don't. I do want to push a little bit back on that just to say what when i started this conversation i asked you to give uh opinions information reflection uh on historical examples of a lot of different stuff um and discussion of the military and i did say this question was coming before we got into that give the people who don't know who tex is because they don't watch BattleTech, they don't you know anything about that why should people think you're not just pulling this out of your ass. I have a lot of background in the study of military history. I've been a lifelong student of military science and military history. I have degrees that forward that, and I have worked in the past as a strategic studies fellow at a think tank on the nature of conflict and armed conflict in the 21st century. I find that understanding the little touches of things, and now some people who hear all that and who do watch Tech Stocks Battletech are probably going to go, wait, that a lot of the stuff in Tech Stocks Battletech is a little close to reality. And I'm like, yeah. yes. Yes, it is. You're right. correct. <laughs> right. It's one of the first things you learn in writing. Write what you know. If you, if you don't write what you know, you will not connect with anybody about any human moment whatsoever. Write what you know. The thing is, is that when it comes down to the study of conflict, 
A lot of people feel that they can go do a, uh, well, read a few stories or watch a YouTuber or two, and they feel that they have a greater, wider, more appreciable lens of the world as it is. The thing that I like to point out is that war is this really interesting thing because it is inherently destructive, but it also requires enormous energies. And as a species, we devote ever so significant resources to conflict because of that which it governs. It redraws boundaries on maps. It will either make a generation very poor or very wealthy with a loss or gain of treasure, loot, and borders. It can determine if people starve or if people thrive. It can determine generations onward who will look back in fear or admiration at the achievements of here and now. War is an interesting study. It is crude and cruel and difficult and chaotic and madness. But the study of conflict is ultimately a study in humanity. And all good stories that come from war are, at their heart, very human stories. It's not about machines or a new gun or a new tactic, but really the decisions and choices of a few at a turning moment. So when it comes down to helping people leave this hugely transformative thing that is core to all of our humanity, especially our modern understanding of geopolitics in the world, keep in mind that what they do is really the equivalent of going on a long distance space journey. It is isolating. It cuts them off from the world. And as explorers of this liminal space of conflict, a place where the normal rules of civilization have been removed, when someone comes back from something like that, it's going to be really hard because all of those rules we take for granted went out the window for a bit. And it separates people. And then the trauma on top of it makes it worse. And so while I tell people, you don't need to understand conflict, really. You don't have to study it your whole life. But if you can understand that difficult times make people suffer, and that kindness can make that suffering less, all you have to do is be nice and be a bit more positive change of what you want to see in the world be reality. Well, that not only answered my question of why people should think you're not pulling it out of your butt, but also wraps up. I was going to say, do you have any words or things to address on the charity that sparked this whole thing? What a, what a, what a great little mini monologue to end that on. Well, I appreciate it. That was very I... well spoken. Thank you. I had given it some thought, but I think that ultimately, and I'm saying this as somebody who's studied conflict their entire life, there's no such thing as being smart, really, in this line of work, just admitting that you don't know everything mm -hmm. and that the world is ever changing. The more someone's willing to say they don't know, the more intelligent they probably are, I found. But. I've I've largely found that any day you will be surprised by shit that shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, remember Frank and Mig, the guy who made a Mig out of multiple. Oh Migs? God, yeah, the bravest man in all of history. <laughs> <laughs> the, the 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 that's one of those things. That's one of those things where like there's always the joke of like I'm going to strap a bunch of rockets to a pair of skates and see if it works. And then yeah. you got someone that's doing the military equivalent of that. And you're like, oh, God. <laughs> and that shit happens. There's always something new that blows people back. And because war is the notion of survival, nation versus nation, idea versus idea, ideology versus ideology, religion versus religion, whatever the impetus or causus belli that drives conflict, you will find that it is humans that are used as batteries in these great machines of industry and war. And... Studying conflict has really opened my eyes that humanity is a very curious and very inventive and very silly thing, especially when the stakes are very high. 
we tend to act crazy. And crazy solves problems. So why should it be so strange to have people helping each other through tabletop? Or, or other video that. games, for that matter. Yeah, exactly. War is crazier than that in reality. I mean, we have people who operate drone programs from, you know, their jammies. I mean, and most most of the most of the drone programs and stuff now are using off-the-shelf, like, second, third-party Xbox controllers and stuff. And it is almost exclusively because people are used to that now, you know? Indeed. Um, so why not use that controller for good? Oh, 100%. And, uh... Just to wrap up, I think that I'll I'll go back to something you just said about humanizing and the fact that we need to remember that people are people and regardless of everything that they've dealt with while they were enlisted, they need to be treated with kindness, compassion, and they need to understand uh, that uh, people uh, as a whole need to understand that they have gone through an incredibly difficult thing and there's a lot of different ways for them to uh, reintegrate. Um, and I think that uh, there was a, a quote that you said a while ago, or I, it's not that you said, but like there was a quote from a certain Comstar presenter that uh, I think really uh, drills down to the idea of the soldier is just a person and needs to be treated as such. Um, yeah. which was, you know, the infantryman is, is, might be the blunt weapon used to win this war, but he is neither the instigator nor the concluder. Um, Indeed. And, and that really, I know it's not the context that that was said in, in the Battletech lore, but I think that does ring true in this case, right? The infantryman was a blunt weapon that was used, but he was not the cause and he was not the, the thing that ended it. And we need to do the maintenance to turn take take that hammer and change it from a mace into uh change it into a, a weaponized club into something that's used to build wonderful things i agree and it's it's the swords to plowshares but with human potential a hundred percent tex i really really appreciate you taking this hour and 15 minutes i expected this only to go for 30 minutes to sit here and casually talk to me about gaming and its use in mental health, uh, shooting the shit about like our hobbies as a in a general thing. It's been not only an honor but uh, a very enjoyable privilege to have this conversation with you. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you so very much. Uh, and while I did have that, uh, while you did have that beautiful monologue to end this on, I do just want to uh, do the the casual wrap-up thing of say is there anything you want to draw uh, draw a spotlight to uh, any other charities any efforts that you're putting out there um, we, are, we are putting the finishing touches on the next tech stocks battle tech and we're probably less than 60 days away from it this one started being written last year and we put a lot of time into these things and so this one is probably one of our finest so far we've got a lot of custom art from all over, we've got all sorts of fantastic talent in this one. And I, I think that this is really going to be very popular uh, amongst, the, amongst the fan base. Because, yeah. again, we, we go hard. Oh, yeah. We, we, don't, we don't make these things at an enormous profit. We, we make these quite literally at a significant loss. But that's part of being a filmmaker. You have to understand why you want to do something. And so for any of you out there who are interested in being a filmmaker, go do it. Don't talk about it. Don't think about it. And yes, you will fuck up a lot. And yes, you will make some absolute shit along the way. But no time like the present to start. Because I started off with nothing, and I've built a magnificent team that can do amazing stuff. And through it, raise enormous sums for charity. And I think that all of us have that potential. I think that each and every one of us can be a filmmaker, can be a singer, can be a songwriter, can be a novelist. You just have to keep at it. And you have to start now. And and I'll add on to that from my angle as a streamer and a VTuber. I'll remind everyone that having a bad stream or text, having a, a video that doesn't do well, uh, having a you know producing one of those pieces of shit that text just mentioned, doesn't mean that you're a bad content creator. And you should be doing this because you love it. And yes. uh, if, if you feel like your content is terrible, don't take that as I'm bad at this. 
take that as I can improve at this. And you exactly. study it. You say, maybe that joke didn't land right. Maybe I could have edited this a little bit better. Uh, whatever it is. And the next thing you put out is better. And the next thing you Indeed. put out is better. And, and, and learn so from every single mistake. Every error, every mistake, own that shit. Mm -hmm. Say, yeah, this wasn't good. And here's why. And, and if, if someone... Yeah, if you can analyze it, you can solve it. And if someone's going to offer you general criticism, don't don't be upset about that. You know, yeah, criticism is how you get better. Yeah, if someone's, I've, there are absolutely people that are just going to be huge like assholes. We talked, or we mentioned earlier that there are just bastards out there. It's true, of course. But well, like, but if at... someone's going to look at you and say, "Listen, I'm not trying to tear you down or upset you, but you know, I have friends who are musicians. But hey, this chord didn't work." You know, well, right. Like, and, and the way the way I remind people about failure is that like a friend of mine got divorced and um, he said, I can't believe I got divorced. I, I feel like such a failure and all these other things. And I sat back and I said, well, Albert Einstein got divorced. Are you smarter than Einstein? <laughs> and, and he laughed. And I said, that's failure. You can do everything right and still fail. Yeah, that's that's OK. The, there's that Picard quote, right? Yeah. Uh, there, that it is possible to make no mistakes and still fail. That is not that, it, or it is possible to make no mistakes and still not succeed. That is not a personal failure. That is just life. Correct. Like, or something like that. It's been a while since I watched Picard's oh, era yeah. of Star Trek, but <laughs> anything's but, better than Enterprise. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, again, I think I'll use this opportunity to wrap up. Uh, Tex, again, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate it, and uh, thank you for agreeing to be a part of this and uh, being being a goal and objective for the charity that I was doing. <laughs> no problem. And I'm glad that you're out there making a positive change. That is very important in this time. Thank you very much. Thank you for being a great person, uh, a great part of the Battletech fandom, uh, and being a genuinely enjoyable content creator. Well, thank you very much, ma'am. I appreciate it. Thank you. And I hope that you have a great Sunday. Will do. All right. Talk to you later.